<laughs> uh, good morning. Good morning. Uh, so the first question you may be wondering is about this boot. Um, let me answer that. I had foot surgery about a month ago to repair an old sports injury, uh, which means that I won't be moving around as much as I ordinarily would be. It also means please be careful when you're near my foot. Uh, and it also means I'm on painkillers, so my presentation may veer into the surreal. <laughs> Let's dive in. Um, so I've been asked to speak specifically about designing for participatory machine learning. Those are huge concepts. So what I'd like to start out by doing is to talk about, or no, I'd like to start out by making an introduction to those two big concepts. Then we'll talk about the Venn overlap. Machine learning. Lots of people use machine learning and artificial intelligence interchangeably, uh, but with the simple case example of R2D2 or BB-8, the layperson doesn't think about AI necessarily as machine learning. Machine learning is a subset of AI, and if you're not familiar with it, uh, it's largely a way to allow algorithms to form models and do pattern matching. For instance, I could show uh, a machine learning algorithm 10,000 images of parrots and then 10,000 images of guacamole and then show it a new image and say, okay, does this look more like a parrot or more like a bowl of guacamole? Um, and then it should be able to say with a degree of confidence which it is. So that task is called classification, where you have an instance of something and you want the machine to tell you what class it's in. Uh, machine learning also has to do a bit with those classes and the relationship of those classes. Uh, a task called clustering, such as people who bought this or people who were stuck in this traffic were also stuck in Paris traffic. Um, machine learning does play into two other fairly common narrow artificial intelligence categories of regression algorithms and prediction, but I am not going to be talking about those today, mostly about classification and clustering. So massively oversimplified introduction to machine learning, but just so that we're on the same term. Second concept uh, I've been asked to talk about is about participatory design. As Fernanda mentioned, oh, sorry about this, I forgot. I was going to show you an illustration <laughs> of exactly why I use the parrot and guacamole comparison, because holy cow, that really is a hard problem for a computer. <laughs> uh, and shout out to Teeny Biscuit. This is not my image. Uh, she's produced a number of these on Twitter, and they're amazing. Uh, Dachshunds and bagels is another one. OK, participatory design. Uh, so, uh, as Fernanda mentioned in the introduction, participatory design is a method of design uh, that brings users not just in for initial fundamental research or even testing of a, of a given, techno given technology, uh, but actually brings them in the room for the design um, so that uh, you can shrink that feedback loop to near nothing. Uh, it was begun in Scandinavia in the 1970s, um, and the user-centered design, is, which is most popular today, is sort of a grandchild of participatory design. Um, but it actually uh, plays out a great deal in artificial intelligence, which will be the last part of my talk. Uh, in the true spirit of Scandinavia, uh, it wasn't just about usability or shrinking a feedback loop, but really about empowering users to have a say in the tools that they use to get their work and their lives done. So participatory design. Again, a vast oversimplification, um, but useful for just sort of setting out terms. We're going to be talking about the overlap of those two concepts. And any time I talk about Venn diagrams, I get to show you the world's greatest Venn diagram. Um, and we're going to be talking about this space in a little bit. <laughs> But before we get to the platypus, uh, I want to give you a little bit of context about where I'm coming from because that's going to inform my take on what this overlap is about. Uh, so the reason I'm on stage with you is because I do a lot of stuff with AI. Um, I run a, a super nerdy blog called Sci-Fi Interfaces where I review the technology in science fiction as if it were real. Uh, and this year is dedicated to AI in sci-fi. There's a lot of super nerdy analysis that I do on that. Um, but I'm not just a theoretician or a critic. Uh, I'm also day-to-day. -day. I work for IBM designing an AI for supply chain professionals, which I suspect no one in the room is a supply chain professional. But if you are, come and chat me up during a break, and we'll talk about it. Um, but I do have my hands in the design and uh, development and release of AI on a day-to-day -day basis. 
Uh, but the reason I think I'm actually in the room is on the far right-hand side of the slide. Uh, in 2017, I published a book called Designing Agentive Technology. And the core thesis of this book is that I believe that there is a mode of interaction between an AI that acts as an assistant for you to complete a task and an AI that is automated and sort of locks the human out. There's a space in between. And to explain that, I have metaphors. On screen, you see two cameras. The one at the top is one of the cameras I own. Um, it is a tool for me to take a photograph, but it also has a lot of AI assistant technology in it, autofocus. There's automatic white balance. There's even a histogram that'll tell me when the whites and the blacks are peeking out in the image I'm about to take. All those are great technologies, but they're still helping me do the task while my attention is on the task. At the bottom is Google Clips, also a camera. But instead of a tool for me to take a photo, it just takes a ton of photos all the time and uses a bit of machine learning in order to decide which videos or images it wants to expose to you and ask you what you want to do with those things. Here's one where you were smiling. Here's one where your kid took their first steps. What do you want to do with these things? Right? The top one has a bunch of assistant technologies, and the bottom one is an agent that just takes the photos for you. Example number one. You'll notice I'm using a lot of Google examples on purpose. <laughs> example number two. Two cars are on the screen. The top is a tool to allow you to drive yourself from point A to point B or get stuck in London, London traffic. But it has a lot of assistant technologies behind it. Uh, it has automatic braking. It has lane assist. It has dynamic following distances, uh, if you happen to be in a Tesla. The thing on the bottom is also a car, but it knows where you are by dent of the device in which you asked for it. It knows where you're going because you asked, you told it your destination when you requested it. And from that point forward, it acts as an agent to get you from point A to point B. You don't even have a steering wheel in that device. It is an agent that drives you. Two cars, one's an assistant, one's an agent. If you don't like technological metaphors, A, what are you doing at this conference? But B, I can hook you up. <laughs> Dogs is a metaphor, my third one. I am not a hunter, but this is the way I understand hunting dogs work. If you have a hunting dog with you, you can go out into the hunting place and tell the dog to flush out the quail from a given bush. The dog will do so, and then you take out your death stick, kill one of the birds, and the dog will go bring the corpse to you dutifully. That is an assistant that helps you with your task of hunting. Contrast that with a security dog, a guard dog, right? The guard dog knows a territory. It has in its mind a couple of familiar faces, and any non-familiar face that enters into that territory will get barked at, both to scare the face and to alert the human. And the human doesn't have to be there helping the dog guard the territory. The human can go eat lunch or go to sleep, right? So dog as metaphor. Clear-ish? Uh, less metaphorically, um, I have developed a model of 27 use cases that are very unique to agentive technology. Oh, huh. That's blurred. Guess you'll have to buy the book. <laughs> I'm kidding. Can you imagine? That would be such a <laughs> jerk thing to do. No, I'm not, not going to do that to you. Uh, and in fact, if you don't want to photograph, you can just go to that bit.ly uh, URL. Uh, it's there. Anyway, so this is the model, the, the sort of diagram by which I have associated or, or, or organize those 27 use cases. And to the point of this talk, several of them are about the participatory machine learning involved with an agent. Whew. Can I show you that Venn diagram again? It's so funny. OK, so we've talked about machine learning. We've talked about participatory design. And I've given you a take on where I come into the picture, or at least my perspective on what that Venn overlap is. And now we're going to dive into that. And I believe the way that participation with um, the output of machine learning changes depending on whether you are uh, pre-launch or post-launch. Pre-launch, of course, you're going to be concerned about whether or not your model is performing according to expectations. You're going to want to test the outputs. You're going to want to refine those. Um, you may even want to uh, have users uh, provide input that form the basis of the supervised learning. Um, that's kind of a niche thing and largely the domain of engineers and researchers. 
Um, I'm a designer and I'm much more interested in the weirder, harder problem, which is when you release your software to the gaping maw of users um, who have not been well trained inside of your design laboratory and will test and stress your software in ways you could not have imagined. More to the point though, the models that a machine learning system will produce will always be a little bit wrong, especially in the context of hyper-personalization, where, for instance, Spotify should work differently for me than it does for Michael. Okay? And I have come up with a list of 14 interactions that I believe are germane to this conversation, and I'm going to go through them now with some Google examples. Number one. Um, there are six interactions about that classification. Again, this task is one of, I'm giving the machine an instance and I'm asking it to what classes does it belong. And there are six interactions for that. Um, for this, I'm gonna be using a non-Google example. Sorry, I set that up poorly. Uh, but that's Spotify. Does anyone not know Spotify in the room? It's cool if you don't. Okay, great. Uh, so what I'm gonna be doing is that mode of interaction where it is proposing a new song. And along the bottom, I know there's a low slide and there are people in the back, um, but there's the name of the song with a little heart next to it, and there are a bunch of play controls, which make a great deal of sense um, from a use user point of view. Oh, I want to tell the machine that I like it, uh, or I want to start the song over again, pause it, or go to the next song. But those actually have meaning when it comes to participatory machine learning. Anytime you have a simple classification, such as user will like this song or user will not like this song, and the system is providing a positive result, which is I think you'll like this song, you have some controls. This little heart reinforces that notion that it's a good selection. The model from Spotify was say 85% confident that I'm gonna dig that song from the Phoenix Foundation. And if I click that little heart, it can know, oh, that's 100% and weight that more heavily within its model. Similarly, the skip control, and there are a lot of reasons why I might wanna to skip to the next song. Um, I don't like it, I'm not in the mood, I've already heard this one today or something. Um, so it's much less weighty as far as the model is concerned, but nonetheless, it's an input that might mean I don't like this song. Right, so this is a tool to allow me to reinforce a positive out of the system. And this is a tool that much less heavily lets me let it know that, oh, you may have gotten that positive wrong. It's a false positive. Of course, we don't deal just with machine learning with positives, we also deal with negatives. And for that, we're gonna take a look at uh, another of my favorite agents, which is your spam filter. This time we are going to the Google example in Gmail. A spam filter isn't there to try and show you things. It's doing the opposite. It's trying to hide things away from you. Um, in this case, we've got negatives. And we need to have controls to both uh, deal with the false negatives and the true negatives. So in the spam filter, um, it could just get those things and delete them. But again, machine learning models are never perfect. So we drop spam into a folder that you can go and review and decide whether or not you agree that that was spam. And in case the model was wrong, you have a control to say that was a false negative. I want you to not only get this out of my spam folder and put it back into my inbox, but I also want you to, in the future, know that either this sender or messages with similar content are not spam. And you need to account for those false negative controls anytime you're dealing with classification. There's also simple access to the list of negatives is useful, but I would even argue that uh, occasional exposure helps reinforce those boundaries. So if a piece of mail came in that was only 85% or near the, whatever the threshold of confidence is um, from the Google developers, um, that some of those should leak into my inbox occasionally to allow me to say, yes, that is spam and reinforce that boundary and also keep the feature top of mind. Not too heavily, maybe once a month, um, but that gives me both exposure to that edge uh, and controls for it. There are two other examples. You may need to do a manual override sometimes um, or ask a machine to ignore an example. Uh, for instance, in Spotify, I might like a song um, that is death metal polka, but only because my brother is in that band. I normally don't want to listen to death metal polka, um, so I need Spotify to ignore that example. 
Um, I don't have other examples for those two, but in the sake of completeness, I included them. Okay, so a bunch of interactions around design that you need to design anytime you've got a machine learning system that you expect users to interact with. But we don't just deal with classification tasks, we also have to deal with the management of those classes, and that's the next seven. In this case, I'm taking a look at Google Photos, and in the context of Google, Google Photos, the classes are people, or really, the people are the core object and the classes are groups of faces, patterns of faces that appear in my photo stream. And in some cases, I may need to be able to set up the new class in advance of the data. I may need, may need to be able to say, hey, expect this class, things will populate within it. Not true with the Google Photos, it just looks at the photos and comes up with those classes. But what I may need to be able to do is to merge classes that the uh, algorithm has decided look kind of separate. These are both my friend Susie, um, and these controls allow me to merge those classes, to say, ah, you think they're separate, but no, they are the same, or to click different and really formalize that difference in the classes. Sorry, my brief pause was, I saw 10.09 up there, and I thought, have I been talking 10 minutes? But no, it's been 16 minutes. Okay, uh, so unique controls to be able to merge classes that the machine has decided are separate or to separate classes that the machine thinks are close together. You also need the ability to delete classes and that's really a user experience way of describing it. What actually happens is you hide those classes. Google Photos, I take a lot of photos and the row at the top contains some of my family members. Yes, I'm interested in seeing more of those photos organized in that way, but there are some randos that appear in my photos that I'm disinterested in, and I don't know if the folks in the front can see this, even things that aren't actually people um, that I need to tell the machine I'm disinterested in seeing this class in the future. And that's a simple show and hide control. The last three within the class management have to do with uh, the relationships of the classes to one another. They can be a very complicated relationship to sort of manage in some domains, but in most domains, a simple parent-child relationship is the simplest for users to understand and to manage. Uh, and for those, I'm gonna to go to Gmail, not in the spam filtering, but in the tagging feature. So if you're an obsessive tagger like I am, you're familiar with this interface, um, but what it allows me to do is to create a class, in this case, pair symposium, uh, and either attach that to a parent right, by clicking the nest control and then the number of parents down here, change it via the drop down, or deselect that button and detach from a parent so it's just a floating class unrelated to the others, right? These controls are common to many machine learning systems as we manage the relationships of the classes to each other. Whew. All right, so we talked about uh, the instance versus the class and the relationship of the classes together and all the interactions that you have to design in order to let users participate and correct the model. There's one more interaction, uh, and that is about trust building. We'll hear a lot more about trust building later in the conference, um, but I wanted to make a nod to this that there is an interaction that you can design for in order to help users build trust. I call that pattern a hood to look under. It's a car metaphor. And the idea is that if, you, if users are ever subject to a decision or a classification from a machine learning system, they should be able to ask the question, why, and get a good answer. At first, I didn't have an example for this. <laughs> but then, literally, as I was working on the deck, uh, I was got getting tired, and I closed it, and I opened up Twitter, and then I saw this ad. Uh, and it was like these sizzling steaks on a grill, and I've been a vegetarian for 30 years, so I was like, ah, I'm gonna hide this ad, I don't need to see it. Turns out that it was actually for whiskey, but when I clicked this control, not only did I see the, I don't like this ad, but I also saw, why am I seeing this ad? And I tapped that. This is the hood that I looked under to understand why I was targeted with this. And it told me a couple of things. It told me that the reason I was targeted was that I was in the right age range and I was a person in the right place. It also told me that this model of who I am as a person was not detailed enough to feel like a threat. And it also told me I didn't have the controls to say, please don't show me meat in the future, I'm a vegetarian. Um, but it's a good example of a hood to look under. Uh, I suspect that in almost any new domain where users are interacting with a machine learning algorithm, they will start out looking into this hood quite a bit and over time build enough trust that they don't need to look under the hood anymore. 
So those are the 14. Um, this is a second draft of this list. The first draft was in the Agent of Technology book, um, but I've added some other things here because I've had two years to think about it. Um, there are a lot of smart people in this room, a lot of whom deal with machine learning. If uh, you find any of these later, like give you pause or you wanna uh, say, hey, Chris, I disagree, or I, I think of one that you um, missed, please let me know. We were encouraged in preparing these talks to end with calls to action. I have three for you. So the first is, uh, I, my day job is with IBM, um, and we don't just do AI, we also talk about AI, just like Google. Um, and we have a website, ibm.com slash design slash AI. You won't find this list of 14 interactions there, but you will find some good fundamentals on machine learning and principles for designing AI. So shout out to my employer. <laughs> Number two, the main reason we're all here today is the Google Pair Guidebook. Um, and it's a great guidebook. In full disclosure, I was an external consultant for it. Um, but if you're <laughs> interested more about this notion of interactions that help with the machine learning, um, I will point you down to this section down here, the feedback and control section. This is the section that I actually externally consulted on, but it deals with a lot of these issues um, in giving humans an ability to give feedback to your machine learning. Um, and props to the team, in the section about feedback and control, I did notice a feedback control, <laughs> which I think is a really good note. Good work, kids. Um, and the last one is, if you're interested in these concepts of agent of technology, why they're different, why it's unique, and what the ethical concerns are, uh, you can buy that book. Uh, if you've already bought that book, maybe you could read that book. If you've read that book, maybe you could give a review. I've got stellar reviews, but there are only 14 of them. The more is always useful for an author who's on uh, Amazon. Um, similarly, uh, if you've read it and you've written a review, I'm interested in collecting case studies. I'm currently working with Matt of Spotify in order to use some of those examples uh, to build up a big case study that I can publish. Um, and I'm also working on a follow-up to this book about the assistant AI because I think there's a lot of stuff to talk about there. Uh, so if during a break you have some fun stories, come regale me with them.